Hey guys, it's Olivia Blake, and this is me not writing. So I am devastated. I just filmed a video, and for some reason it didn't work, and the file is corrupted, and so I... I guess we'll try again, and I don't know if my answers will be as good this time, and also I only have 15 minutes, so I'm going to cut it off and probably finish again later. Any uh, logistics stuff, I will be in the UK next week. You can find tickets to all events on my about page of my website uh, or my link tree or in any of my social media bios. I'm not really on social media right now. Um, I'm just very busy and it is like sort of clutter to my head uh, at, not, at present. Also, I've had some complaints about not going to certain places in the UK and basically everyone who has complained is from a place where I have been before last year. Uh, so just know that if I'm not coming to where you live this time, I will probably be there in the future. I do have a lot of books coming out with the UK and I probably will be back. So I'm sorry if this isn't the time, but I'm sure I will make it there. Um, lots of people are asking me why I'm not coming to Scotland. I've come to Scot I came to Scotland twice last year. I love Scotland. Um, but uh, it just didn't work for this tour. Maybe next time. January's cover for my anthology was just revealed. That comes out on October 15th, and you'll hear a little bit more soon about which stories are included in the collection. Um, but I think as a whole, because a lot of the stories I wrote are quite long, um, it's probably about half new material, half old material, classic material. Uh, so let's see, what questions do I have that I can answer that I already answered, but it's gone forever. I did get a lot of questions about the Atlas Complex, some of which I will never answer, and some things that I will answer, but like later. Um, definitely the Atlas Complex is a book that you're supposed to sit with for a while. I, I, I My hope is that it makes you think about something or feel something, and both of those things take time. I'm the kind of person who, um, if a book stays with me for a while and that I'm like chewing the material for a while, that's what I really like out of a reading experience. If it's not what you like, my apologies, um, but that's definitely the design. And so I wanna give you time to chew and we can talk about it another time. I think there's some th some easy ones we can get out of the way. For one thing, um, someone's impersonating me on Facebook. I don't have a Facebook. I think what they're trying to do is sell like either reviews, or, like reviewers, I don't know, or like, or like marketing publicity services to it seems like indie authors and I'm really sorry that they're targeting you um, but I never used to those things and I um, am not doing that to you now. I'm here, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Tumblr, um, I'm on Spotify, I am not on Facebook and honestly this is one of the reasons why. Policy regarding audio versions of my fan fiction. So my policy for audio is the same as for bookbinding, that as long as you're not making any money off of it, it's fine. Because uh, that's a copyright thing, that if any money is made um, off of somebody else's source material, that is a copyright violation. So I'm trying to avoid that. Um, so yes, so if it's for personal use, if you're doing it for you and your friends or um, there's there's no exchange of money involved, it's fine. Uh, the only thing that I don't allow is translations. I've talked about this before. It's just because like the only thing that I get to own when it comes to fan fiction is like the sanctity of my words and why I chose the words I did and using colloquial phrases that don't translate literally and um, just stuff that like, the more you write, I think, the more you understand that every word is a decision. And I want to be part of that decision. I feel, it feels a little bit, I just, I just don't feel that I can safely guarantee that what I wrote is being translated true to the spirit that I wrote it if I'm not involved in the translation and I'm not able to be involved in the translations right now. Like theoretically, if someone came to me and I had like, a bunch of free time and I was like yes let's work on this together let's let's figure out why this word is the correct choice versus this one then I would do it but I don't have that when it comes to my books that's obviously a different situation because there are many other gatekeepers involved um, I have foreign publishers and um, professional translators and even so there are some translations that I try to be involved in and and that that 
occasionally I don't feel are in the spirit of, of things correct. Um, so yeah, it's just a, it's a time thing. I would want to be present and I can't be. So that's why I don't allow translations. But everything else, as long as no one's making money off of it, it's fine. Which is again, just a legal thing. Just, just keeping us lawsuit free. For signed books at Village Well, um, so you can get signed and personalized books at Village Well. Uh, the link is in all of my bios. Um, will the paperback versions of my books ever be offered? I, I think they are offered, but it's just whatever's in stock. This is a very small bookstore. So if you want something, you can contact them and they will arrange it for you. They will order for you. Um, but also if something's not available, it's because it's a very small store and they only have so much in stock. It's not like they're actively not there for a reason. Anyway, am I retired from Germany? I wouldn't say retired from Germany. I would say more like conscientiously objecting uh, to J.K. Rowling's um, imagination. It's just not a place I want to play in anymore. I think with my understanding of what goes into craft and why you choose certain themes over others and why you create characters um, that are the way they are, you know, that there's just, uh, there are certain things that I can't ignore anymore. Um, so that's just not something I want to engage with as a creator. Someone wants to know five informations about translations of the Atlas complexes in other languages. You have to be more specific. A lot of times when it comes to foreign rights, that's something for sub rights to know and me to find out. Um, so I can always find out for you, but I'm not given those dates. Like I, I find out when you find out basically. Um, so yeah. You'd have to specify. Is the prequel for the Atlas series meant to be read before or after books one through three? <laughs> it's a prequel. Uh, but it's also not a prequel. I don't, okay. I don't know why Sacred Hospitality is on Goodreads. It's not a novella. It's a short story. It's just, um, it was written as pre-order incentive. And it's basically just like fan fiction of the books. I call it a, an extended cinematic intro. Like if I were doing a director's cut of the Atlas series, then, you know, we would have this like much longer um, perspective into the different characters before they uh, enter, before they are recruited by Atlas and before they enter the Alexandrian society. Um, but it's like for fun, the events have no bearing on anything that happens later in the books. Uh, it's just like, I mean, it might deepen the characterization if that's something you're interested in, but I just want to tell you it is not 0 0.5 of the Atlas series. It's just a short story. So you're not missing anything if you don't read it. Um, and you could read it at any time, literally any time, and it would be fine. Difference between the red and blue covers. Very simple. Geographic region. Actually, it's more like legal publishing region. Um, if you live in North America, your cover is red. If you live in the UK or Commonwealth country, it is blue. Those are the only differences. The, the inside of the book is exactly the same. The Barnes & Noble exclusive does have an additional short story. But other than that, everything is exactly the same. Um, bunch of Atlas Complex questions I'm not going to answer. So someone asked me if I have self-publishing tips and <laughs> I do. Uh, I'm not the best person to ask about self-publishing. However, it might be like, it might be faster to go to my old videos because I basically filmed all of these things live. Every decision that I made as I was self-publishing has a video to go with it. Um, and right, like right now, all I can tell you is that everything that happened to the Atlas six was a complete accident. It was a complete stroke of luck that I had nothing to do with. Like, I don't, I don't even know why the self-published versions of my books are valued so highly because they have a lot of errors in them. Like I didn't hire a proofreader. <clears throat> I didn't pay for a professional editor. It was just like me and my friends editing. My understanding of my self-publishing was I have these stories and I'm basically just making them available to my pals. Um, and I'm, I'm pricing it so that I make $1 as a royalty. Um, but it was never like I'm trying to produce these at a large scale. I, it was certainly ne I was never trying to scale up. Um, I was just trying to like release the stories to anyone who might want them because I was trying to get traditionally published. And that was my main focus. There are lots of other authors who had like much better self-publishing journeys. Um, Kennedy Ryan, I think, still like is a hybrid author and does some self-publishing. I think Katie Robert self-publishes. Travis Baldry is a good example because these are all people who 
went about the production of their self-published books in a in a professional business-like way whereas I was just kind of like playing um so I'm not necessarily the best person but if you're trying to decide between trying to self-publish and trying to be traditionally published the difference is do you want to run your own production do you want to like you are going to need to outsource some things you're gonna need a cover designer if you can't if you're not a graphic designer yourself I did my own um exterior and interior design work the interior was pretty lacking um but like that's something that you might want to ex that you might want to outsource if that's not something you like to do or are good at um you will probably need you need an editor at very least you need a proofreader um again things that I didn't have because I knew that like I was giving in to my friends and they could forgive some typos I tried not to have typos but inevitably there were some which happens in traditional publishing too and it's it's kind of crazy to think about that. But yeah, try those other authors. I think they have more to say uh, about self-publishing as a business. But if you want to self-publish, yeah, you have to you have to want to do your own business. You want to do your own, theoretically, your own audio production, your own foreign rights. Um, if it's exciting to you to really own every part of your work creatively and beyond, then self-publishing is a very viable path. Um, you do have to like sort of churn out work more quickly. Like the way that you make money self-publishing is not like selling a lot of one book, but in kind of luring people in and then having like pretty like regularly produced work, um, which is true for fan fiction as well. You hook an audience and then you keep them coming back. Unlike traditional publishing, which really like you survive on a, a book a year kind of contract, unless you're me and unwell. If, if that's not interesting to you and you just want to write, traditional publishing and then you want to work on querying and you can find out about that also from watching my old videos okay i gotta go for now i will be back we'll talk about more stuff unless this video also doesn't work and then who knows okay i'm back from meetings and from sitting in traffic and i have replenished my blood sugar i have no idea what we were talking about or what i was in the middle of saying i think it was something about self-publishing also i got my eyebrows done so <clears throat> some of some of my face is worse for wear. Okay, I forgot to mention, question mark, um, that the pre-order incentives, um, I now can't remember if I said this already or not because this is like my second slash third try. Twelfth Night. Twelfth Night is now releasing on May 28th and um, it, the pre-order, the US pre-order incentive, sorry, I'm seeing some, I'm so tired, I am, what a day, 12th night, which I'm excited about. And just in time for Valentine's Day, I tell you this. Uh, it's, yes, available to pre-order. You can get a special edition pin, which is super cute. The whole book is just, I'm just so, the work that my team has done at Tour is just amazing. Um, as always, I am just extremely grateful for where I am in the publishing world. Uh, so yeah, so like I may or may not have already said, if you are the kind of person who wants other people to take control of production and marketing and publicity and all this stuff be, so that you can write your little books, traditional publishing is the way. Okay, so someone did ask me if the Atlas 6 TV show is moving forward. And the answer is yes, but there has also been a step back. Let me let me open by saying the industry has changed a lot post strikes and I completely support the strikes and I completely think that the, they needed to happen and I'm really proud of the Writers Guild and um, the Screen Actors Guild and I'm glad they did it. It didn't. It does mean that studios are um, a little less, they're holding tight to their wallets currently and the Atlas 6 as it was planned while it was in script, because it was in script, was going to be a very, very expensive TV show. So Amazon is out, uh, but my producers are still in and it is definitely still in play. It's still happening. This is just Hollywood is very weird. There's a lot that I can't tell you. Um, a lot of really good things that I can't tell you and everything moves really slowly. Um, so yeah, nothing imminent, but I'm also kind of feeling like there might be better homes for what the TV show would be. So it's definitely still something that is in progress, but I still feel really confident in my creative partners. I still feel really good about the passion that people have for the books. And yeah, I know things fall through all the time. I'm not too worried about it right now. And like I said, there's a lot of stuff, like way more than you think that I'm not allowed to tell you. <laughs>
<clears throat> okay, hi, all of you. I suspect that I have ADHD on top of being autistic, so I struggle with conquering complex tasks and identifying emotions. Let me just say, it's a little weird for me, I think, to like diagnose you in this way. It seems like what you're actually asking for are writing techniques, and I'm not going to say they're writing techniques for ADHD or autism. They're just writing techniques if you happen to have certain strengths over, the, uh, over others. It's really important to me as someone with bipolar that I don't address these parts of myself as if they're weaknesses. The person that I am has strengths and flaws built in and I think something that happens to be true about me is not the whole of me and it just it just kind of matters to me how I answer this question which is to say I'm going to disregard the ADHD and um, autism like aspects of this and focus on the details of what you're asking so any tips on how to revise novels and how to revise novels um, when when that may be overwhelming and how to make characters uh, more than one dimensional under these extenuating circumstances. Again, everybody has strengths, everybody has weaknesses. So um, in terms of like executive function altogether, everything is much easier if you set things out in steps and make them sequential. Like that's always true. I think this is true for people who tend to be, to feel anxious about writing as well, that you cannot you cannot think of your first draft, I say this a lot, you cannot think of your first draft as the book because that's just not the case. A book is many, many, many drafts. It's many contributions, it's many ideas, it's many evolutions of things. Um, so to look at a book as a singular finished product is sometimes very, very overwhelming. And if you look at revision as something, as like one big thing that you have to do in order to make a book, that's gonna be very stressful. So I like live and die by checklists. I find it really satisfying to check things off. and it also helps me to create um, like deliverables, <laughs> actionable items. That's very helpful for how I work. So I am, I'm a pantser. I don't believe in pre-writing. These are things I've said before. Um, I, I do a lot of troubleshooting. And basically when I am writing a book, this is my process. I write the first draft and the first draft is me telling the story to myself. Because I'm a pantser and I don't plan things in advance, I plan things in advance. I don't necessarily know what the book is about. Like I know the characters' motivations and I know the like textures of the relationships and I have an idea of themes. But usually, and you know this people who are experienced writers, that when you come to the end of a book, you even if you pre-write it, even if you outline, you suddenly understand that the thing you thought you were writing was actually something else. I like to leave myself open to that discovery and not tell myself right away what kind of book I'm writing. So for me, I write the first draft and that's my way of telling the story to myself. I put it down, I think for a while, what did, what was the book really? What was it really? So like the Atlas series is basically me trying to understand how to live. Um, Gifted and Talented, which is the book that will come out after the, uh, which is the next standalone book that will come out after January's, my anthology. Gifted and Talented is like, what is happiness? And then Girl Dinner is like, what is feminism or what does fe what does the next stage of feminism look like and so these are questions i don't really understand until after i've already written the book so once i've written it and i think about okay what is the impetus here what am i trying to say how can i make these themes stronger how can i make relationships stronger how can i like sometimes there'll be a little twist that i sort of built in but because i didn't know what i was doing it's not as strong so i make a list of all the things that need to improve so without even going back to the draft after having finished, here's the things that it needs, all the plot holes I need to fill in order to make that story more fleshed out. And then I go in and go back and I do it. <clears throat> I do it one by one sequentially. And then I go back to the beginning and I reread the whole thing. And then I fix things that you sort of stumble over as you're reading. So this is sort of the line by line revision where it's just like, okay, does this part of the book make sense? What was I trying to say here? Is this scene necessary? Is this scene contributing to anything? Do I need another scene? that um, <clears throat> there's, <clears throat> I have a tendency to like sit still for too long where characters will just talk to each other and there's no action. Or like in the Atlas Six, um, at some point I had Mr. Blake read it and he was like, there's a large chunk in the middle where no magic takes place. And so then I wrote um, the scene where Nico and Libby repair the house's wards uh, because he said there, this was missing. So after the second draft, after going through line by line, that is the time I would say maybe, I, I used to do an additional draft by myself, but now 
because I have a pipeline of works and I'm usually working on things in multiple stages simultaneously, uh, that's the point when I send it to an editor. And so in your case, since you're asking about like emotional beats and um, characterization, I think the only way that you can do that, if it's something that you question about your own work, uh, is to have another eye. But you also want to bear in mind that a person's reading experience is very subjective. So you want to give it not just to someone you trust, but to someone who you want to get out of the book, like someone who enjoys what you think the book is. Um, because there are lots of people who might say, who will say a character should do this or a character, or like a normal person would do this. And that's obviously very subjective. So who, you want to give this book, your book at this point, to someone who is like your ideal reader, like someone who is really into whatever this thing you've just written so that they are going to see it in a fair light, I think that like it is something that appeals to them, but also is something that they can contribute to, um, especially if you're worried about things like having a, an emotional follow through. Um, I, I care a lot about characterization. And I think the thing that you love most tends to be the thing that you're best at, which means that that sort of thing is also the hardest thing for me to give advice about because it comes most naturally because I care about it the most and I'm the most experienced in it because the books that I read are predominantly character driven or voice driven. And I might say be weaker at things that are very plot driven or very detailed in the world building. Um, which like, this is why I say when you, when you presented me <laughs> with your conditions that you probably have a lot of strengths that I don't have. You're probably very good about, um, creating logical timelines, which I am not good at it. I often have to be told to put a timeline into the book, um, because I just don't, I don't care about the, the tedium of, of how we get from place to place or what year it is. So, you know, just bear in mind that what you bring to the story, like when you do those first couple of drafts on your own, you are bringing your expertise to the story. You're looking at it through the lens of yourself as the auteur. And then you want to bring somebody else in who can give you some perspective on stuff that you are maybe missing. Um, <clears throat> so for you specifically, you definitely want to find a critique partner or an alpha reader or just someone you trust who doesn't even have to be a writer, but just someone who can say like the this like this moment doesn't make sense or I, I don't understand where this person's reaction is coming from, things like that. This emotional arc, I don't follow it. Um, that's something that you could use to help inform you. And I think that as you write, you'll you'll learn to like sort of self edit in that way to kind of anticipate which moments people don't understand. But even so, it is helpful to have another perspective. I just always want to add that because everything is so subjective, like lots of people love my books for the characterization and lots of people hate them because they hate the characters. And that's okay. The books are, it's art. You're making art. So you never have to think that something is one dimensional um, if it doesn't feel that way to you. You know, I think that you, there's, there's this, there is a threshold you can reach that's like you can make people feel real, you can make your world feel grounded, you can make the emotional, the emotions feel rooted. Um, but beyond that is just opinion. So find someone you trust. And um, but also like as you approach things with with your checklist, with your trusty checklist and going through things like literally troubleshooting as you go, um, I think that will be things will be a lot more bite sized and manageable for you. Uh, SOS. I'm in my late 20s, early 30s and have to move back in with my first gen Middle Eastern parents in my hometown due to some money problems. I like my family, but they're overbearing and I have less freedom than what I've been used to for the past few years. I feel so shameful because all of my friends have moved out and own houses and I worry how this will affect dating. Do you have any practical advice on how to manage the situation? Okay, so I feel you because um, I left home and would have no interest in going back. I mean, I, I definitely, like, I wouldn't call it home because I haven't since I was, like, 20. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I understand. First of all, okay, I think this is a headspace-orienting thing, right? So you want to go into this situation with, like, a very good faith understanding of what's happening. Let's start with like internally, you going back, you should look at this as 
It is a wonderful thing that you have your family to fall back on and your family loves you and they welcome you and they want you to feel at home and that matters Um, and that's something that's important and even though you will definitely be frustrated and you will feel ashamed at times, um, there is no timeline by the way, there is no finish line for doing life correctly. Just because it doesn't look like other people doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. I get why it feels like it in the moment, but just a reminder that you're not. But, you know, this is this is a really amazing thing that you can count on your family. And so I just want you to go into this situation remembering that, that not only do you love them, but they love you and that matters. In terms of practical things, I think that you probably want to sit down with your parents and have a discussion, your parents such extended family, whoever is now living with you, and kind of set some boundaries. I also think for yourself, you might want to establish a timeline. I don't know what is a realistic timeline for you in terms of saving money, Um, but say theoretically that you're like, okay, I'm going to do this for six months. I think that it's better and more manageable for you emotionally and psychologically speaking if it's not just a huge unknown. Like if that... If that deadline gets pushed off a little bit, it's not a big deal. But I think the idea of going into a situation not knowing how it will end, like that's too big for the human brain to comprehend, you know? So I think it would be best if you decided in advance, like this is the number, this is what this is what my goal is. By this time, I will be moving out and moving into a different situation, whatever that situation is for you, if that makes sense. Um, cause certainly not everyone your age owns a home, uh, and you could easily find a roommate and find other people who are in similar, uh, under similar circumstances. It's the, the majority of the world is where you is closer to where you are than to your homeowning friends, just for perspective. Um, but you also want to have a conversation about your family, about what is like, private time and what is family time and what is expected of you while you're living in the house? Are you going to contribute to the household chores or anything like that? Um, I think that's something you want to understand going in explicitly rather than being like surprised by what is expected of you. I think you also want to, like my mom, for example, is very big on family time. And when we're all at home, she wants us to have family time, even if we're not really doing anything. And so I think you want to establish what is family time and what is your time when you're doing things or when you're, you know, kind of just, like I said, just establishing some boundaries. Maybe don't use that kind of, those kind of words because they're very therapy speak. And I think that puts off especially immigrant parents, but just this idea of like, what if we took some time every Friday or what if we had dinner together every night or, you know, and that was like our time. And then after that, like, you know, that you understand I'm an adult and I'm going to do things for work and I'm going to do things for my social life and stuff like that. I think it's just best if you know what the expectations are to the best of your ability and can have that conversation and also get an idea of what your family wants out of you while you're living there so that you can find like at least a decent compromise that makes life better for all of you Um, because you're certainly not regressing into childhood. Uh, and, And I think that making that clear to yourself and to your family will help ease potential problems down the line that come from miscommunication. Unfortunately, that's like the best I can do. Um, <clears throat> I, If anyone else has advice, feel free. But yeah, I, I think that just by necessity, your relationship in the house is going to change. Um, and, and with your family, it's going to be different than it was before. And as much as you acknowledge that up front, like the more you can do that, the better. And finally, cause I think now that I'm doing this in two parts, it's going to be super long. Okay. <sighs> Hello, Olivia. I hope you're a still big sistering. I am to the best of my ability. Um, because I have a slightly silly situation. I've been talking to a guy slash casually dating him for a month and a half. I'd asked him over text today if we were moving forward in the relationship. And he very nicely said no, which is fine. But I feel an unprecedented level of misery right now, and I don't know how to get past it. I feel especially silly because I'm 25, and this is the first guy I've ever dated, and well, I feel too old to be acting this ridiculous. I don't know, it's just a waiting game until I stop feeling like garbage, but I wish I hadn't asked at all because I grew quite attached to him. How do I stop thinking of what ifs, and how do I stop feeling like this? It feels so unnecessarily overdramatic for a casual month of dating between two adults. No, 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 no. Uh, This is the thing, right, that like, One of the underlying 
sub themes in the Atlas complex is that like the world is not an idea like many times existing in the world in the current world is often holding many things inside your head you can hold these like socio-political tragedies at the same time that you hold the very very crushing breakage of your fragile heart you know and even if you don't want to call this heartbreak it kind of is because you know it's like you said you have a, it's I to me I think you're grieving the loss of a potential future. And, uh, you know, especially at 25, like when you're in your early 20s, it's just kind of like the recklessness of youth is still very present. And this idea that like, I can do whatever I want and there are no consequences. Like you don't, you don't know of consequences yet. And then in your mid 20s, you start to realize like what kind of person you actually are. And like you've run out of, typically by your mid 20s, you've run out of those like achievement markers you're you're not you're not getting good grades you're not um you know your job isn't to get a's and your job isn't to get into grad school or to get into college or whatever like there's no the the idea of how to succeed becomes much more opaque and the concept of success is much more fluid and you have less of an understanding of what the finish line to like happiness looks like which is kind of what gifted and talented is about also but um like that, all of that is a lot for a person to hold. It is not silly. There is nothing silly about the way you're feeling. And I think that it's important actually that you sit with this and you feel it because the only way to get through it is kind of to sit in it um, and, and to realize that, first of all, even if you hadn't asked, this guy was not going to give you what you wanted. He just wasn't, he wasn't in it in the same amount that you were. And he probably saved you some time. And I know that sucks. But the good news is that you're going to feel, you're going to feel attracted to someone again. You're going to feel love for someone else who's going to love you back in a way that is much better and more, um, like more, <clears throat> you're not going to, there's going to be someone you don't have to hold yourself back from. And that's the person that you want to be with. You want to be with a person who makes you safe enough that you can say everything you feel and you don't need to take that. You don't have to take any of it off the table. And you don't have to hide any of it. And you don't have to take anything slow, you know, like not, not that I'm telling you to rush, but there is a person out there who's going to be so excited about being with you. And it's not this guy. And I know that that sucks. And I want you to feel okay feeling that that sucks. But there is something, it's cliche. I can say there's something better waiting for you, which is true. But there's also a million different things waiting for you that are just different from this thing. And there are all these things that you have no idea yet that you could want. Um, and just one of the great things about life is coming to terms with the unknown and the idea that life will surprise you in good ways and bad. And that many of the things that you think you want, like you're kind of still working with the residuals of what you've been trained to want. You're grieving the loss of your happily ever after, even though this was never your happily ever after. Um, it's just the, this feeling like that you should be on a track, that you should be on this road to something. Um, but this just wasn't your thing. This wasn't your door. Uh, and that's okay because there's going to be way more doors for you to walk through and choose and experience. And there, you are going to feel so many different kinds of love for so many different kinds of people in the world. And I know that that's sometimes like that's, that's scarier than it is exciting. Um, but it's true. And I, I know that it doesn't feel great where you are right now. Um, and you know, I have felt that many times also, but it takes you somewhere. All of this is about, I want to, I want to get rid of the idea of a destination. This connection mattered and this is changing you in a way. And I think that's also what you're feeling is the idea that this is changing you. And, and I hope it, I hope it changes you, you know, in a way that you can look back and feel that this was still a meaningful experience in your life. The truth is, yeah, you can ask yourself what if all day long. But I think the only way that you get through it, get through this, is to acknowledge that this is where you are now. Um, and just feel your feels. You will feel excited about someone again. And you'll be with someone who is excited about you. And that's what you really want more than someone who doesn't want to move forward. If you want to move forward, 
then that's the person that you need to be, that you need to have the time and space for. And it's not this guy. Um, okay, well, that's everything. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. We'll see if this worked. Anyway, this has been me. I'll be like not writing and I'll see you next time.